Punisher Waterfowl, welcome to episode 34. Ha <laughs> ha, fucking lied to you. Told you that I wasn't going to say the number anymore, but I did. So episode 34 of the Union 0430. We are recording on a Tuesday night, which is so weird, uh, but we're doing it because we have the opportunity to have the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Hank Shaw on with us tonight. And if you for some reason, I've been living underneath a rock for the last little bit, and you don't know who that is. Continue to watch, and, uh, and I'm sure you're going to learn more about them. Um, and back once again, you are, Mr. Horse, the first return back-to-back -back episode guest on the show. So I know there is like ones and twos of people requesting me to come back on and I really felt the love and I just had to come back on and uh, talk to everybody again. Hey, buddy, you should feel privileged. Um, so we'll I get do. into a good introduction of Hank here in a second, but uh, we'll go around the table. We've got Mark just outside the nation's capital and outside of Ottawa. We got Philly in the dirty schwa and Dave up in Concordon. Oh, and sorry, we have Steve in Hanover. Mr. Shaw, where are you located? Sacramento, California. Sacramento, for oh, Jesus. I you're, like, you're not getting any snow, are you? What's what is the snow of which you speak? Of? <laughs> what is this white stuff you speak of? <laughs> we can visit snow. Um, if I feel like seeing snow, I can drive up to ten thousand feet. Uh, yeah, stay where you are. Sacramento sounds way nicer. Um, I have more ducks too. Yeah. Oh, don't see. Had I shot, I shot two what are we what are we two minutes into the show and he's already throwing shade on to us eh um i shot <laughs> two ducks this morning did you really yeah. Good yeah for you um for those of you that are watching on youtube um you will notice that all you see is hank's name down in the corner and that is because hank doesn't like computer cameras and oh, hate him hate him and he has taken a very firm stance on not showing his face. And uh, you know what? We're not going to argue with him. So You can uh, just put the V for Vendetta photo up there. And it'll be, it'll be <laughs> good. Oh, yeah. Guy Fox. Awesome. Um, so without further ado, Mr. Hank Shaw. There he is. Mark's showing us picture right now. Um, a very, very impressive re resume, Hank. You know, you're a hunter, gatherer, gardener, um, scotch drinker, and you'll even dip into the Pops Blue Ribbon, which I cannot understand how anybody can drink that stuff. Um, it's not as good as Molson Canadian, I admit that. Well, Molson Canadian's not good either, but, <laughs> um, but you know, a very impressive, and, and, you know, you are what you preach. You are, you, you hunt, you garden, you gather, you, you cook. Um, you are who you are. You don't pretend to be anybody else. Um, you call it ha how it is. Um, you know, a past guest on, on the Joe Rogan show, which was, which was awesome. You were published in field and stream or field to stream. Um, you know, amazing, uh, an amazing resume, uh, for lack of a better term. And I cannot thank you enough for coming on. Anytime. Short and sweet. Love it. That, that, that was a huge workout. Yeah. <laughs> it was. It's a long walk for a cup of coffee. Big intro. <laughs> um, so like, like I said before we, we hit the record button, I'm not I'm not much of a not much of a 
a person for in, in the kitchen or anything like that. But my biggest question to you is if you are picking a bottle of scotch, what are you drinking? Day in and day out, probably the Balvenie. Oh, my favorite. Yeah, I used to be, you know, my my stepfather used to drink, you know, crap like Cuddy Sark or J&B. And so I'd say I still have a kind of a a a, a, a fondness for that because that's like, that's that speaks to the 1970s and the early 1980s. But if I'm going to pay for it myself, I'm probably going to get, you know, Alban or Balvenie or if I'm feeling smoky, the Lafroy. Oh, see, I'm not a big Ooh. fan of the smoky PD stuff. Um, but uh, Oban, uh, Belvini, uh, Delwini, still uh, any of those. It's, uh, anything from the Highlands, I'm a big fan of. Um, lower. But I'll be honest, I drink more mezcal than anything else. I've never had that, so. Yeah. Well, they don't, I don't think they allow it in Canada. Oh. You that's know, like wow. bird dog whiskey. Yeah, so that's we, like we, bird we got dog resources. Whiskey. We got resources. We'll get it into this country. <laughs> <laughs> We're still fighting the fight to get bird dog whiskey brought yeah. into Canada, but. But speaking of Dal Winnie, yeah. I've had I've had Dal Winnie, yeah, and wow, like liquid candy. Yeah, it's pretty oh, smooth. so nice. Yeah, um, and then you have how do you have a palate for Dal Winnie and then Pops Blue Ribbon? Like, how does that happen? How does it not happen? <laughs> <laughs> I'll throw it back to you. How does it? I not mean, happen? you know, seriously, like. <laughs> Uh, unless some, some you're, days it's quality or quantity right well yeah, i mean shit man i mean like if you're gonna serve me a hot dog serve me a good hot dog I don't, it's not all caviar and foie gras for me hey well, good point buddy good point and uh and with that question i digress <laughs> uh oh and you can go into a restaurant and get 32 ounces of it for like three or four dollars you can't yeah. turn it down that's like 20 cents american <laughs> Jesus Christ! Uh, this is so true. Be, I already yeah. know this is going to be an awesome show. <laughs> <laughs> hey, the Canadian dollar was making ground last week. I believe we got up to eighty-two cents. Who towards cares? The, towards. <laughs> the Who cares? Yeah. Yeah. It's not like we can do anything with it <laughs> south of the border, right? Yeah. Right, or us north, like our. Mm. I can't tell you how many guys I know who were supposed to hunt ducks up there, and uh, they couldn't go this year because of the Rona. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, same, well and we some had of us. A, so Phil, Phil and I had a hunt planned in, uh, in Missouri. Well, Southern uh, Missouri and, and hopefully going to crack into Arkansas and, and that will <laughs> go as well. So, yeah. I've actually hunted that spot. You're talking about the boot heel down by Cape Girardeau probably, right? Yeah, uh, probably. Um, it was a gobbler, gobbler. Yep. I know that. Gobbler, well. gobbler Missouri. Yeah. Good hunting. Lots of big fat mallards. That's Aww. what I want. Well, I shot two hens this morning. Wah, and killer. Wah, fucking hen killer. And <laughs> killer. Yeah. Okay, after bandit. Hey, buddy, I, I, hey. Wanted to, I wanted to get things going here and, and start, you know, to, to, to read, you know, the, when I read about you and, and try to, you know, find out about, you know, you're a gardener, you cook, you, you put out a book, you're... you're Four books, actually. Four oh, yeah. books? Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. um, but your, your desire to keep pushing forward with wild game in a world where, you know, it's not, it's not the thing that everyone's doing it's because it's so easy. And I assume in Sacramento, California, it's way easier to head down to... Uh, head down to the supermarket than it is to get out and, and, and shoot some mallards. But you know, what, what drew, like, what was your influence to, to pull you into this world? Well, I actually didn't grow up hunting. Um, I grew up gathering wild plants and mushrooms and fishing. Of, and, and I've been doing that since, I've, God, I, since before I can remember, but I didn't start hunting until I was in my thirties. So what had happened was I had moved to Minnesota and a buddy of mine who I worked with at the time, he, he was the outdoor writer for the newspaper that we both worked for. And we had been fishing all summer. And as summer turned into fall, he said, all right, well, it's time to go hunting. And I hadn't hunted before. And I had been 
tossing the idea around in my head a little bit and he kind of gave me the push that I needed to, to get out there. And when I finally got out there on a hunt, it was a, it was a pheasant hunt in South Dakota. The thing that it really attracted to me was, yeah, the food, you know, because, and I'll, and I'll talk about what my first interactions with wild game in a second, but what was really most interesting is his ability to read land the way I could read water. So I've been a commercial fisherman and I've, worked in charter boats and, and commercial boats and you know you know that if you're an angler a real fisherman is not just someone with a rod and reel in his hand it's someone who knows how to read currents and seasons and moon tides and all of this thing and and to know where the fish are to drop your your rod and reel and you know the catching of the fish is only the final part and i knew this from birth but i didn't know about that on the land and and he showed me how to read fields and read forest edges and you know he'd be like get ready and I'm like well why and then boom a pheasant would get up and that was really fascinating and yeah. I had never seen that before and it was really really interesting and and he'd been kind of buttering me up with you know he'd drop me a pheasant he'd, he'd say hey you want a couple of mallards or do you want a piece of venison and and I already knew that these were in my mind primo things to eat because when I was a little kid I'm the last of four and there's a seven year gap between me and my next sister. So at the time, um, my mom and my stepdad really, really liked to eat good food at nice restaurants. And I grew up in New Jersey, mm -hmm. right near New York City. So they would take me to fancy restaurants in the late 70s and early 80s. And I got exposed to venison and goose and pheasant and squab and quail and all these things in nice restaurants. So for me, the association has always been game with high-end classical quick cooking. And so that just kind of stayed with me my whole life. And, and when I finally got the chance to actually cook this stuff, it was, uh, at first it was all sort of very old school French, French and Italian cooking. And then I kind of expanded off of that, but I, I never really had um, the negative connotation that a lot of people have with game meats as opposed to the farmed meats. So that kind of helped me out in what I do now. Um, I, I'm, I don't want to get too far down, down a rabbit hole on this, but when, when you're, where did you learn the, the water? So I, uh, you're in Sacramento now, is it safe to say that you learned that on the Pacific Ocean or? No, no, I've lived in nine different states and my mom is from Gloucester, Massachusetts. Oh, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. North <laughs> Atlantic. Yeah. yeah. So the North Atlantic is where I learned everything. Okay. You know, and, yeah. you know, the Jersey Shore, you know, New Jersey has a lots of things that are deserved and undeserved as its reputation, but it is one of the premier fishing states in the, in the union. And not a lot of people know that, but fishing is religion in new jersey really i didn't mm -hmm. i didn't know that i didn't either you, you should watch some more wild tuna damien well i do watch wild tuna but they're but they're always fishing off gloucester right some of them come from new jersey really yeah. but they're down they're down on the carolinas the last yeah. show i watch now so it is a pretty cool show though. yeah it is it is an awesome show sorry <laughs> dave you look like you're ready to pounce oh i'm I'm just enjoying listening, but uh, <laughs> uh, if I get to pounce in, yeah, go for Hank, it. The video that I watched that really got me looking at your cookbooks and listening to other videos of yours was one where you talked about how to properly cook a duck, and you you talked about hanging your birds, um, and that kind of got me interested, and I started trying it this year, and I was just wondering if you could explain like what that actually does to the meat. Um, how long do you hang them for? Do you hang them by the feet or the head? Um, just kind of go in depth on what hanging your birds does. So for talking specifically about waterfowl, uh, waterfowl in upland, I hang in two very different ways. So I don't really actually hang waterfowl very long um, because where I live, they're all fat and because we're a wintering ground. So they just, they put on a lot of weight and you can be morbidly obese and, and, and it's an amazing fat, some of the greatest eating birds in the world, in my opinion. And the problem with hanging a very fat bird, like a duck or a goose, 
is that, well, there's two things. One, fat's an insulator. And two, that fat can go off at temperatures that would not affect a skinny duck. So um, number one, it does not matter whether you hang a bird from its feet or its tail, or a feet or its head. Um, there's no difference on that. But what you're, what you're trying to do with a duck, uh, especially a duck or a goose, because um, you're, you're, I'm going to wax pluck at these, these birds anyway. So I'm not going to use, I'm not going to dry pluck waterfowl. I don't do that much anymore. Like if I've shot one duck, sure, I'll dry pluck it. But I usually don't shoot just one duck. So they're going to get wax plucked anyway. So the number one benefit of hanging any bird is that it makes it easier to pluck. So for upland birds like grouse or woodcock or, you know, pheasants or something like that, hanging them for three days to five days is going to make them infinitely easier to pluck than if you pluck them that night or the morning after. So that also holds true with waterfowl, but because I do this paraffin wax method, it, that doesn't matter. The real thing is you get a bit of a concentration of flavor in birds. So that can be good or that can be bad. So if you're shooting buffle heads or, or you know, sea ducks or God forbid mergansers, you don't want any of that. You want to clean your birds right away. But if you're killing nice mallards or pintail or wood ducks or speckle belly goose or something that, where the, that you know that bird's going to be quality, it, can, it will taste better if you let it sit for a little bit in cool weather. Now, there's a big caveat to that, especially where you live. You cannot do this with, can, uh, with giant Canada geese. So you can, you can hang Canada geese, but you got to gut them because they're so big that they have so much thermal inertia, they can rot from the inside if you don't gut them before you, you hang them. Now, mm. now, mallards you can, but um, I've, any number of people have reported back to me like, yeah, I hung this 13-pound Canada goose at 50 degrees and it rotted. I'm like, well, yeah, that's why. But it's the shortest, this is a long way of saying that you do it for flavor and you do it for ease of handling. Thanks. You, brought it, you, oh, you brought it up about mergansers. Is there any way to make a merganser taste good? And also, <laughs> here, in Can here in Ontario, we can now shoot cormorants. Have you ever heard of anyone cooking a cormorant? Only in a survival situation. Yeah. And even They're fiendishly you, disgusting. I, I, would eat, I would eat my best friend before I'd eat him. <laughs> yeah, but she's pretty. Cormorant. <laughs> <laughs> yes! What's, wow, what was that movie? Alive? Yeah. Yep. I'm yeah, having the mountains, but, the Andes. Yeah, the, the, oh, yeah, 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 whatever. Yeah, you start a little rump roast there on the Barbie. Nice. <laughs> now, mergs and, and God forbid cormorants. I mean, the only thing that you're like, the only way I could, if you said, hey, Hank, you got to cook this and you have to make us not all throw up. Uh, I'm going to skin the birds. I'm going to find every molecule of fat that I can and get rid of it because all of the fishiness, let me rephrase that. 90% of the fishiness is going to be in the skin and the fat. So if you skin the animal, you've, you've gone a long way to making it less disgusting. Now, for anybody listen, out there listening here who's from Newfoundland or Nova Scotia or the Maritimes, they're all going to be shouting at me like, but I like to eat turs. I'm like, well, good, great. You're going to love mergansers because uh, <laughs> it's basically the same thing. Yeah. So I would skin the birds and I would soak them in salt water, you know, about a quarter cup um, of, of kosher salt to about a quart of water. And it's, a, it's, it's a, neither a strong nor a weak brine. It's kind of a very standard brine. Do that in the fridge overnight. That's going to pull a bunch of flavor out, which in this case is good. Um, and then if they were really still rank after that, I would soak them in milk one night as well. If you do that, all those things, yeah, I bet you I could serve it to you and you'd be fine. That is awesome. Uh, we're, me and Damien are from land, and I, I, don't, I don't like tur. No, I don't like And I definitely either. don't like McGanzer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am legit sitting here scrolling through Hank's website, looking at some of these duck recipes. I'm just like, and there's save, a lot of diver duck recipes. Save. On that. Like, oh, yeah. You, you got we shoot, one. We shoot surf scoters all the time. Really? Mm -hmm. So you got, you got one oh. here, Hank. Thai red curry duck. Well, that's a good one. I'm going to shoot some big fat mallards and make this. You should. 
I hundred percent going to like I am I am like just drooling here. Like just prep time. I, I like this. It's gonna take me forty five minutes to make this whole meal. I'm sold. Cause you put stuff on this like prep time twenty minutes, cook time twenty five. I'm like, that's like a two beer event. I can deal with that. that he dumbed that's it down though. for us. Yeah. He dumbed this it is, down. This for is us. some legit like. Well, he's this talking stuff hunters. Is, he knows his. Oh yeah, <laughs> you gotta make it fucking simple, right? Like, like honestly, Hank, like you've like your website, you this is laid out extremely well. Thank you. And you, it can even tell us me how fat I'll, I'll get. <laughs> Calories six hundred and ten. <laughs> Fuck whatever. Got to go one day. <laughs> but this is like well done. And he's now, got a book called Duck Duck Goose. Duck yeah. Duck Goose. Yeah, that's awesome. Which I, is uh, actually available in Canada. Yeah, yep. it's on I, Amazon.ca. I used <laughs> it. Uh, I used it as our uh, social media plug last week, but we ended up missing you last week, so I'll I'll reuse. Actually, you know what? Just to sort of kind of piss you off because you don't like computer cameras, I'm going to post a picture of you up <laughs> on our social media for our uh, post tomorrow, saying that that we had you on the show. Just just, uh, just use the Guy Fox sign. It'll, it'll work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's pretty impressive. That I was going to say to you about uh, Mark and I both being from, from Newfoundland and, and obviously um, sea ducks is, you know, it wasn't a big part of my diet. Um, my dad loved them, not so much me. Um, but I didn't bring it up because I was like, oh, what are the chances that he knows where Newfoundland is? Um, so. I used to fish with Newfies in, uh, when I was in New York. Oh, really, eh? Mm hmm Awesome. Lots well, of Newfies there. Well, Good they fishing. say, yeah, so Boston, you know, Boston's cobble streets, uh, uh, all those cobblestone streets in Boston, all that cobblestone came from Newfoundland, right, for the most part. So, hmm. uh, so, so yeah, so there, there's, and, and actually, um, I don't know if it still happens, but there was a time, there was a stretch of time of 20, 30 years where, um, where the Christmas tree in, in Boston actually came from Newfoundland. So, That's Nova Scotia. Oh, was it? I was going to say that the connection between Boston and Halifax is pretty strong. Oh, okay. That's it. Oh, I'm an idiot. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> like Boston is, to Hal Boston is to Halifax as like DC is to New York. Oh, wow. You know, they're, they're just, you know, yeah. it's considered like, oh, yeah, we're going to Halifax or you know, there, it's, there's been, there's like 300 year old trade connections and business connections between those two cities that still exist. Oh, oh well. Um, I'll edit out that last bit that I just threw in there because you I lie. Can... <laughs> no, shit. Um, Steve, I know that you are just chomping at the bit to, uh, to get some get some advice here so uh, I'll, I'll open the floor up to you buddy yeah uh hank i'm glad you come on it's uh it's a bit of an honor for me to to get to talk to you just because i'm someone too that you know i love anything different that i can do with wild game i'm a i'm a semi adamant proponent against poppers and <laughs> tough I'm poppers kind of the and same thing. Like I actually, this. I like poppers in their place, but yeah. there are so many people who are like, that is the only thing they do with game. And then that gets a yeah. bit old, a bit quick. Yeah. Like dove stuff like that you see dove people, it's like dove poppers. That's all you make with them. It's like, how would you want to shoot that many doves and just cram it in enough pepper and bacon until you can't taste it. Okay. Um, there's a, I have to stop you on that one because so Dove poppers on on Labor Day for that opening weekend of dove season. It's more than just food. It's it is the dove poppers to Labor Day is what turkey is to Thanksgiving. So it's oh. that thing that you have to make on Labor Day, and everybody's got their own version of it. And it's so I think you go, you and I would both agree that okay after Labor Day cook it another goddamn way. But like <laughs> on Labor Day, do the poppers. Because so it's, it's more it's, it's, it's more of a tradition you, thing than yes. it being yes, the exactly. only thing you do with it. Exactly. Right on. No, um as far as questions go, um, the one I really wanted to ask you, but I was reading an article and found out that you are a 
a lover of crows so that you refuse to eat them. No crows, no cats, no dogs. Mm. So that, that was my first question was going to be, what would you do with something like that? So I guess my next question would be, <laughs> when it comes to waterfowl, for somebody getting in to trying it, um, and this could be duck, goose, any fowl whatsoever, do you find that there is certain cultural cuisines that lend themselves better to certain birds? Like, would you say, you know, if I'm going to cook a goose that you want to stick with something, you know, traditional European stuff, or do you want to go more, do you want to do Mexican? Do you want to do, is there stuff that lends itself? Same as a duck, like, is it, is there regional cuisines that lend themselves better to making it so that it's more appealing to someone who's new to eating it? That's a good question. Um, for someone who is new to eating waterfowl, I'm going to get them like the, the free bag of crack that I'm going to give you that's going to keep you coming back is a mallard or pintail or wood duck breast skin on, seared so that the skin is crispy. There's still little fat underneath the skin, but the meat is medium rare. It gets salt, freshly ground pepper, and a squeeze of citrus, and that's it. And I'm going to hmm. slice it and then get, put it in front of you. And there's no one on earth who's not going to love that. And that's no real cuisine. But that's, it's, it's basically a steak wearing a hat made of bacon. And no one doesn't like that. So that's kind of that thing that's going to get everybody hooked. It's easy to make. It's hard to master, but it's easy to make. And it's one of those things that, there's it's universally appealing that so to answer your question about cuisines though yeah mexican french and chinese are the those are the three cultures that have the strongest association with ducks and geese um the the muscovy duck was domesticated in in central america several thousand years ago and the french as you know are very very good with ducks and so are the mm -hmm. chinese the the Scandinavians and Northern Germans are pretty good with it too. So if you look at some of those, you know, the old school recipes from those cultures, you're, you're, you can't really go wrong with them. Like another thing to, to really hook somebody who's not used to it would be duck confit. So I would do that with um, Canada goose legs primarily if I lived where you guys lived. And, you know, you pick the, you, you got to pick the goose uh, because you need the skin and the fat and you salt it overnight and then you slow cook it super slow in either its own fat or some more duck fat or lard. I suppose you could use butter, but you really want to do it in duck fat until, and you slow cook it like at, you know, 200 degrees Fahrenheit or lower uh, until it's done. And when it's done, it means it's gonna, It's about to fall off the bone. It hasn't fallen apart yet, but it's thinking about falling off the bone. And then you take that and then you take it out of the fat and you put it under a broiler or a very hot oven, like, you know, a 450 degree oven to crisp that skin up. So that's basically the kind of a, a, the same deal. You've got that crispy skin, you've got fat, and then you can take that goose leg or that mallard leg or whatever you want and you go and pull that right off the bone. And it's, it's crazy good. That's another one of the, where like, there's just nobody on earth who doesn't like that. So I love that. <laughs> I saw you actually uh, recently you were putting up, you were showing people how to render their own duck fat. Oh yeah. Um, how many, how many ducks do you think, how many ducks, maybe regular ducks, not the, the fat wintering ground, <laughs> California mallards, but um, somebody more to the East side getting, getting some mallards, how much fat, how many ducks would that take to make enough fat to actually confit something? Uh, hard to say, but I got almost a liter of rendered duck fat from nine ducks the, this weekend. Wow. Mm. And yeah, <laughs> these were, these were gordos, but, uh, but I would say double that for typical ducks. Um, but it's not that big a deal because what you do is you, you know, you get your bits of fat here and there. And then you just put it into a plastic bag and you put it in the freezer until you have enough. 
I mean, you're not gonna, it doesn't matter if it's a little bit freezer burn, who cares? Mm -hmm. um, because you're, you know, you're going to chop it up and render it. Now there is one, you know, you guys had asked me at the very beginning of this, what keeps me pushing and what keeps me, you know, doing this. I've been doing this for 13 years. I've, Hunter Angler Gardener Cook has been online since 2007. And I still do things new every, t every year and I'm still pushing and still trying to experiment. But the thing that I kind of hit on last year, which is one of those aha moments, is when you're rendering your fat for years, like a decade, I would just chop up bits and throw it in the throw it in water, bring the water to a boil. When the water boils away, enough of the fat has melted so that then it just renders in its own fat. And there you go. And I would toss out all of the cracklings essentially because there would be like preening glands in there and some bones and I don't know, maybe a trachea. And it, it's like, yeah, I don't necessarily want to eat, you know, slow cooked trachea. So I would just chuck that stuff. And what I thought about, because there's this Mexican dish called chicharron and salsa verde. And so there's two kinds of chicharrones in, in Mexico. There's the, the pork rinds, which you and I know and love, the kind of poofy, you know, pork mm -hmm. skin that's crackling, right? And yeah. then there's cracklins, which is like super crispy pork belly where the fat's been rendered out of it. And that's what this is. So you get the exact same effect that you do with, with pork chicharron and duck chicharron, and then you simmer it in a homemade salsa verde, and then you serve that on a taco, it's crazy good. And it's this new use of a bit of the duck that I had never really had a use for until about last year. So, so that's a kind of a long way, way of saying that, you know, you're, if you trim all those little bits that you collect over the course of a duck season to things that you would actually eat when they're cooked, you can make that dish. I, I, I you, you would handle goose the same way, right? Absolutely. Now, there is a, a, a piece of advice I would have for if you want to go about doing this. Start with mallards, pintail, wood ducks, speckle belly geese, Canada geese that are eating agricultural products, you know, like grain or grass, uh, but not, you know, the thing about mallards and Canada geese is they can kind of eat anything. And there have been some pretty rank mallards that I've seen in my day. I mean, they're, they're mallards that have a habit of eating dead salmon in the West Coast, which is no bueno. Um, and then you can see Canada geese in like sewage plants, which is also no bueno. Oh, yeah. So, but in general, both of those species have very good tasting fat. Wood ducks will always have good fat. Pintails will always have good fat. Green wing and blue wing teal will have good fat. Um, interior canvas backs. So you canvas backs in the interior of the continent uh, are always going to have good fat. Speckle belly geese are always going to have good fat. So, but there are lots of other ducks like gadwall can be good or bad. Widgeon can be good or bad. Um, redheads can be good or bad. So there are, there are a number of birds that if you put their fat in with the good fat, you can taint it. And then all your, all your problems, are, you know, I mean, you just ruined your whole project by putting like, scoter fat in with mallard fat which is disgusting that's not kosher 100 percent not kosher no. <laughs> hank i wanted to just step back because this is something that i personally don't know so i'm thinking there's other people that don't when you talked about your uh your dry pluck versus your wax pluck because i i'm not i don't know what this is could you explain what this wet, and I know you said paraffin wax, but could you explain what, what this type of you bet. So we have a video on YouTube. Uh, you just, if you actually YouTube how to pluck a duck and you'll see two videos, one is a dry pluck and one is a wet and it'll be pretty obvious from the get go. So okay. that'll, that'll help you after this. But the short version is you take your mallard or whatever and you rough pluck it. So you, you pick most of the big feathers off. Not all of them, but you pick, you know, you don't want flight feathers, you don't want the tail, and you kind of just go and pick, pick off a lot of the rough, big feathers. Then you chop off the wing, the wing tips. I usually, on a mallard, I actually keep both the first two digits in the wing because I make duck buffalo wings at the end of the first Super Bowl every year, um, which I can get into. But so I make him, I hold him by the feet and hold him by his face and make him swim around in hot but not boiling water. So it's, it's, if you've ever plucked a chicken, you know that you want water about 
150 degrees Fahrenheit, more or less. 160, 175 is fine. But you don't want it boiling. It's too hot. Now, on that water is somewhere between a finger and two fingers deep of melted wax. And wax will float in the water. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you make this duck swim <clears throat> with wax to coat him. And then you immediately plunge him into a five-gallon bucket full of cold water. And that sets the wax. You hold him there for a, you know, a 60 count minute or so. And then you move him to a big bin or you can leave him in that bucket if you wanted to, but that water is going to heat up. And then you, you let that wax completely solidify. It's pretty easy if it's cold out. And then you keep moving through and moving through and moving through. And so you have a bunch of these ducks that look horrible. They look like, have you ever seen the movie The Mummy? Yeah. You know, like the second one where, where um, uh, Imhotep is all like, bleh, he's all like enclosed in like obsidian or whatever the hell it is. Face and everything. Yeah, and he looks super unhappy. Uh, <laughs> all your ducks are going to look exactly like that. It's super sad. It's the saddest they're ever going to look, so don't take pictures. Um, but when you get them out of their tomb, they're entombed in this wax. When you crack, the, you crack it so that you can get at it and you... You free the duck from the wax. If you think about it that way, you're not going to rip the skin. You don't, you don't just go hauling off to pulling the wax. You, just, you free the duck from the wax, and it comes out looking exactly like a store-bought duck. And uh, I have some really good pictures of it on my Instagram feed right now if you want to look. Um, and it's, it's oh, I've seen those. life-changing. Talk about, uh, if you don't mind, let, let's talk about Duck, Duck, Goose the the book and and how and how people that are listening right now who are salivating and and wondering how how can I get this um, talk about duck duck goose and and exactly what what's in there and and what people can expect in in purchasing this book because as you mentioned it is available on Amazon.ca so there's no reason why. Uh, Canadian listeners can't jump on board with that. Exactly. It is the Bible of the animal, basically. Like, it is the single, and don't believe me, look at all the reviews. It is the single best waterfowl cooking book that's been written in probably ever. Um, I spent many years perfecting the recipes. So all of the recipes are heavily tested. Um, because here's the thing. If I ask you to cook that one pristine canvas back that you shot this season. And if I ask you to do something that you're not familiar with, it better damn well work because you're not going to, you can't go to the store and buy more canvas backs. That's right. Um, that said, the book is designed to work both with domesticated and wild birds. And I, and I will tell you in any given recipe. So if you're using a store-bought Pekin duck, you're going to have to do this or the other thing. But if you're using a skinny migratory mallard, you do this other thing. And I also factor in the fact that a green winged teal is not a Canada goose, is not a mallard. So mm -hmm. there's a huge section on the different species and breeds for the domesticated birds. Because if you're listening to this and you don't hunt ducks, which would be weird, but if you do, um, you would want to buy a Muscovy duck mm -hmm. and because that is the closest thing in the store bought world to a wild duck. It's darker meat and, and less fat. And Basically, a Muscovy duck breast is like a speckled belly goose breast, if you've ever had that. Yep. Uh, I have. Yeah, and they're kind of amazing. So it, it's basically soup to nuts. It, you know, the, the slogan we used when it came out is it takes you around the world from beak to feet. And it has got everything from super simple recipes to really trippy, chefy stuff that I did just because I could. And uh, the, sim the single weirdest recipe in it, now – there's over a hundred recipes, but I had to throw in one bizarre one because it's me. Is I did crispy fried duck tongues. Okay, interested. Right? And because so as a fisherman, I'm sure cod tongues is yep. is so that's a delicacy for me uh, and Merck, both of us. So now you got me really curious. So it only tongues. works with big ducks, so okay. mallards, pintail, geese. I mean, you can do it with other, all these ducks, but you know, actually, you know who actually has the best tongue? Is are the spoons, the northern shovelers. Yeah, uh, yeah. they got that big Little old, big old, big old face. Um, but they got a big tongue. Exactly. <laughs> so, like Gene Simmons. <laughs> <laughs> totally. So you, yank, so you yank the tongue out, preferably after the duck is dead, 
Um, <laughs> and and you, you collect them all season long because, you I mean, yeah. they're not real big. And so this, I'll do this for Super Bowl. And admittedly, this is, this, is, this is a long walk for a cup of coffee, but it's worth it at the end. So you collect all your tongues during the season, and then you braise them until they're pretty tender, which takes about an hour to two hours. Because there's a bone in each one of them. It's a little bit like a cod tongue. There's a bone at the base of each one of them that you have to pull out. And you have to pull it out while it's still, you can't, they, they can't be cold because it'll rip it to shreds. Mm -hmm. So you pull all the stupid little bones out, which is a little persnickety, but it, you know, it takes maybe 10 minutes. And then, and then you dry the tongues a little bit. You can either do it in a, in a low oven or you can do it in a dehydrator. And the reason you dry them a little bit because it, because they're full of collagen as well as meat, as well as fat. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've ever had the misfortune of frying something with a lot of collagen that's still wet. Yeah. But it explodes like 350 degree, like nuclear hot stuff flying everywhere. And it's just the worst. So by drying it, you remove the moisture content so that instead of exploding, it just puffs up. So it becomes like a little bit like a pork rind, but it's a duck tongue and it's amazing. So, and the, and the only experience I had to this, and Mark, you'll know, um, in Newfoundland, we call it, so if you get a, a cod tongue and it's really big and you try to fry it up, um, we call it slobby. So it's that collagen and, and it's really like when you bite into it, it's, it's just gross. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Um, <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, so, so now I'm thinking um, that that would be the same with, with a duck tongue and, and the way you're explaining that. So just um, removing that little bit of moisture uh, would make a huge difference. That oh, I it's never, a game changer. Yeah. Hmm. I love cod tongues. It doesn't matter how big they are. <laughs> Don't matter, man. Philly. Uh, I don't like fish. I don't like fish. <laughs> you don't like you're probably, fish. You're hey, probably you're, nowhere near. You probably live nowhere near an ocean, then. Right? No, no, time. he's no. he's from Ontario. From um, Toronto. Yeah. Do you know what's the best? <laughs> you know what's the best part about fish? Throwing them back. Yeah. Here we go. Here we go. Here. Philly's never tried a fish. He just needs a merganser once. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just that's, assumes, yeah. that's a just fish assumption. by proxy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> the flying fish. It's the same fucking. <laughs> so. Whoa. So, uh, so Hank, you never, uh, so this, a couple weeks ago, Mark and I went down and hunted with some friends and, uh, one of, one of our friends there, he brought his two sons along who are absolute fanatics, um, when it comes to waterfowl hunting. So just young kids on, under the age of 13, I would say both of them are, um, so, um, at the end of the night, we done a, we done a deep fried turkey, um, which was, which was amazing. But the boy, we had shot a meganser that day. One of the boys had shot a meganser. So these two young fellas, they were determined to, to eat what they shot. Like a so, rite of passage. Yeah. Yes, you know. So they, and, and despite all of the adults, they're telling them that it's not going to taste good. They were determined they were going to eat it. So they wanted it deep fried in the same turkey fat that we had used, the same fat that we had used for the turkey. And these two boys sat down and ate it and then ended up talking a bunch of other adults into eating it because they said it was so good. Um, I have asked a lot of people over, over my time hunting about a good way to cook a meganser. And I thought deep frying it like that was probably the best. But now after talking to you, I, I think there may be hope if you put the, the time and effort into it, um, maybe you can make a meganser taste all right. You can, yeah. but you know, I've, I've hunted ducks for 20 years now and I've yet to shoot one and I aim to keep that streak. <laughs> yeah, just, That's just, probably just the don't. best path. <laughs> just don't shoot them. Just don't do it. Same unless thing you've with got a, heads. Unless oh. you've got a dog and you need some training birds, just don't do it. And yeah, we don't want to ruin your dog either. No. <laughs> Um, but I, but you know, you, you talk about diver ducks and stuff, but redheads are, are great. Bluebills are great to eat. And, so, and, I, and I don't even do anything special with them. I just, just sear them in a pan. So you Here's say a good, that. 
Sorry. here's a good test on that one. So uh, bluebills range from sublime to vile. Um, <laughs> Those are the ones I had, I guess. <laughs> good like, Lord. Like bluebills uh, in the San Francisco Bay, you have to skin them because they're only eating clams and they okay. stink like rotten clam. Right. Whoa. However, I shot any number of bluebills in the Delta Marshes in Manitoba mm -hmm. and they were better than the mallards. Yeah. Yeah, so, all, all throughout here, Hank, like the bluebills, the cans, the reds, they're all eating grasses and stuff. Same mm -hmm. shit the mallards, like with the exception of flying to fields and getting into the beans and corn, on the lakes they're eating all the same stuff, right? Wild rice, wild celery, yeah, and so Yeah, that's so going to make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, like that's all. huge difference. That, that's what our, our reds and blues and cans are primarily feeding on, like, but then, yeah, you get into your golden eyes. Um, hey, man, that golden eye's been eating corn. He wasn't the first one to eat that corn. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's recycled corn. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, like the blue, uh, like the golden eyes and the uh, the long tails. Yeah, that's a that's a no no fly zone there. The most disgusting duck that's not a merg is a harlequin. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The most beautiful duck on the face right? of the earth, ne next to a, next to a mandarin. Vile. Yeah. Vile. Oh, they're good for one thing only, right? Mounting. Mounting. Wall. <laughs> Shoot one pretty one and then just pass them up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, that's one, awesome. One trip, one trip to Alaska. Shoot one. That's it. <laughs> but like we, we were down at uh, Long Point there, or not Long Point, uh, Mitchell's Bay, and yeah, we Lake shot St. a bluebill. Yeah. yeah, Lake St. Clair. And we shot a bluebill, and we're with. Uh, uh, Anyway, the guys that we're with, uh, when they shot the bluebill, the guy that we were there with, he's like, oh, that's, that goes to the pep rep pile. And Jason Sears like, no, man, bluebills are delicious. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, and then the guide, he's just like, no, man, those are pep rep pile. I'd rather eat an old squaw. And we're just like, what the fuck? Like, really? It's kind of weird how the different areas mm. find different birds taste better, you know? Like, and that's, I found mm. that weird because we, yeah. I'm on one side of Lake St. Clair and Sears on the other side. And we both eat bluebill and this guy that's in the very middle. Nope. So hundred percent diet, de diet dependent. Yep. So yeah. there's one, here's the, here's the exception that proves the rule for us with bluebills. So sometime right around now in December, greater bluebills come down from the North mm -hmm. and greater bluebills have a much more, uh, they're much more likely to have been eating eelgrass than they are clams. Yes. So if you shoot these greater bluebills and eat, same thing, you can shoot them right next to the, the lessers in San Francisco Bay, and you pick the, the feathers of the of the breast, and that fight that fat is ivory, and you're like, oh, it's an eelgrass bird, and it's going to be amazing. And then two weeks later, all the greater bluebills have switched over to clams, and their fat's bright orange. Uh, I, I got a question. Can you tell the difference between a migrator and a local bird? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a story that's coming with this too, Hank. So, oh boy. sort of. So, um, it's going to be vary from place to place. But the, the there's a thing called Bergman's rule, and Bergman's rule is that the individual of any given species that lives closer to the poles will be bigger in size. So that's why Scandinavians are bigger than people from Italy. Uh, it's why a whitetail in Alberta is, can routinely run 300 pounds, where a whitetail who scores exactly the same in Texas will be 160 pounds. So that's true. You see that with mallards quite a bit. So th they talk about the northern birds. And, oh, the northern birds are coming down. They can be up to a half a pound bigger than a bird that spends its whole life in California. So in that case, and yes, you can, you can definitely see a difference. Um, that said, virtually all ducks are migrators. I mean, wood, even wood ducks migrate to some extent. Um, and they migrate out of here, so. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so can you tell the difference, you know, if it doesn't have a band on it and it's not a gigantic fully plumed ma mallard in January, it'd be tough. Uh, it's, 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 awesome. Go ahead, Phil. It's, it's reasonably, um, Reasonably easy for us here, like in uh, southern Ontario, Hank. Um, between like your your greater and your lesser geese, like all, all our lessers 
come from James Bay. And like the, the like pretty much like the vast majority of our greater Canada's that are here in southern Ontario, they don't fly. Ah. Uh, they don't migrate. They they go you from the megas water, too, don't you? Uh not, like I, well, I've shot a couple Canada's. I've been tickling like fourteen pounds. Yeah, I mean so they got they got heads that on area them. Like, around Buffalo has has the Maximus, which they can get as as big as sixteen. Yeah, like they they got heads on them like freaking softballs. Crazy. But like I've I've shot some lessers where Christ they ain't much bigger than a a fat mallard, right? Mm-hmm. But yeah, like we at least like where where I'm located, in Ontario, we get a shit ton that come down from James Bay. And like you can legit, you watch the flocks. If they're intermingled in the flocks, you can pick them out like night and day difference, like half the size. Oh yeah, well that that you're talking about a different subspecies. So yeah, like there's well, well the lessers migrate, our our graders don't. Gotcha. Them lazy pricks, they're just like cause especially where I am on, on Lake Ontario, it's a short, it's a hop, skip, and a jump from open water to food. So they never leave. That's become more and more prevalent all over the continent. Yeah. That, the, like that the big Canada geese are becoming more residential. Yeah. And just, they're not making the trips to Mexico. So they just get fatter and fatter. They just, they just feed, they do two things feed and fuck. And shit. Uh, that's all they do. Shit, that. They shit, shit everywhere. everywhere. Oh, wow. Well, and if you were to ask the average anti, anti hunter here in Canada. The Canada goose is a protected species. The, as ca- well. the Cana- yeah. Canadian goose. The Canadian yeah. goose. It's a national, national bird. bird. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's national bird. I thought and the seagull the- or some shit was your national bird. Because I remember <laughs> yeah. like I remember there was a, one of our baseball players fucking exploded one in the in uh, and he was playing in Toronto and the Dave like, Winfield. Yes, <laughs> Dave Winfield. <laughs> I've seen it live. Vapor. It was awesome. <laughs> hey didn't fucking uh didn't uh didn't uh, Randy uh, Randy Johnson do that with a pitch? One uh, he did. He did. He, did. he, yeah. he missed pigeon. it a pigeon. It's yeah. vapor. Vapor. <laughs> oh, yeah, it, was it, was just, it was just feather yes. dust. Yeah. <laughs> pink That's dust. some impressive video. I've seen that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have you guys ever seen that video of the guy, the, the news reporter, and he's talking about fishing? And he's just like standing there on the side of some dock, and he – has his lure he's like yeah fishing's a great way and he goes and he throws his lure out and he fucking hooks a duck with it the duck oh. was flying and he hooks it really and like and the thing's like going nuts like of course he's like uh and they had Oops. to cut it away from him like oh yeah that's a great video that's not <laughs> ideal oh. yeah not not ideal i got some stories for you after we hit uh <laughs> after we stop the, the unrecord yeah so, hank what's your favorite white fish from the sea Hmm. Like so, you're talking about lean white fish, white meat fish, white meat fish, probably the California sea bass. Oh, really? Yep. California sea bass is uh, it's the Goldilocks fish. It is uh, white but not too white, lean but not too lean. You know, it's it's it tolerates um, tolerates you messing it up a little bit, whereas like halibut doesn't. Um, halibut, overcooked halibut tastes like dry chicken breast. Mm-hmm. You're right. Yeah, um, I agree. And, you know, I, I mean, obviously, I like my Alaskan fishes, you know, like the Pacific cod and the halibut. Um, hell, I'll even like a fresh Alaskan pollock, you know, the, the fish stick fish. But, you know, the lean white fish to me are, you know, because I'm kind of a professional eater. They're nice, but they kind of bore me. Um, you know, I'm much more excited about like a really good salmon or a really good amberjack or a really good tuna or really good i mean probably my favorite fish in the world is yellowtail which is a jack yeah i thought you were gonna say flounder <laughs> i like flounder they're good yellowtail flounders type of flounder too oh oh yeah that's right the yellowtail flounder no yeah no, they're not my favorite flounder actually the winter oh. flounder is my favorite flatfish oh yeah and you get them you get them in the maritimes probably on, i'm not even yeah. sure what Back home, we're we're getting flounder and and yeah, we get, I don't I don't know what type of flounder it is. Yeah. <laughs> well, where I'm from, nobody eats flounder. Like oh, no? it's no, it's Could not a fish. Anybody. It's not a fish that you know what I mean. It's not a fish that that had a market where I'm from. 
it might be there's an arrow tooth flounder that lives way up high in, in the Pacific, and it might be circumglobal. So it might, you might have the same, just like halibut are on both sides. Yeah. Um, and the arrow tooth flounder has this bad habit of, by the time you get it to shore, the f and then you cook it, the meat turns to paste. It's like it looks like Elmer's wallpaper paste. Okay, yeah. not that. So there's a couple of a couple of really high altitude or high latitude um, uh, flatfishes that do that. That 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 could be the issue there. Uh, could be because I, I'm pretty certain that my grandfather has eaten everything that's coming out of the North Atlantic, and if it was fit to eat, he ate it. And I can't remember ever hearing tell of him eating flounder. So, you big conger eel fan? No. I don't know. I don't know. Then he didn't eat everything that's not that's fit yeah. to eat. These conger eels are damn good. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, well, he may have. Um, but not something that was ever put on the, on the table in front of us. But then, you know, we were, the, the new, where I'm from in Newfoundland, there was no experimentation when it come to food, right? So there were no spices, no different ways to cook it. It was either boiled or fried. That was yeah. it. You had salt and pepper. Salt and pepper. That was it. That's it. That's, that's why what Lori McCarthy's doing over at Consounds is so cool. Do you know her? No. No. Oh, you need to follow her. She, Lori McCarthy is her name. Um, and she runs a, a, an outfit called Cod Sounds. And okay. she's doing amazing things with food up in Newfoundland. Okay. Lori McCarthy. This is I right in your guys' wheelhouse. Yeah, it is. You're probably even related. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. Well, no, let's, let's not get all <laughs> Prince Edward Island on here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <shit. laughs> the world's largest oh. open-air insane asylum. Eating it wild. <laughs> I'm already following her. <laughs> oh, yeah? Cool. Yeah, I'm um, already following I, I got a question for you, Hank, for, for a duck recipe. And for some reason, I have this stuck in my head that I want to come up with, like, or at least find a good recipe for duck breast, carved off the breast bone, so just the duck breast, the fat, and the skin on top. What, what's a good, simple recipe to, to try out with that? Well, I think if you rewind this podcast about 20 minutes, you'll, you, I just went through that. I probably got up and had a beer. You yeah, probably did. <laughs> still got up. But actually, if you watch the video, the one that Hank did about uh, how to cook them, and he even talks about, like, you got to hold the, the small part of the breast down to make sure it doesn't curl up. That's mm -hmm. a good video to watch. Oh. Yeah, that that's um, that's it. You know, it's the it's a, and that's how I cook ducks. That's how I'm cooking ducks probably in another hour. Um, is I'm making duck tacos and I'll I'll sear the duck breasts medium rare with the skin on, mm -hmm. uh, and then chop it up small, put it in flour tortillas. Nice. Now, do you well, score the skin? Only on super super fat birds. I always score the skin on domesticated ones because they're really fat. Um, and I did actually score the skin on a pintail this past weekend that was incredibly fat, but not normally. Yeah, Let's, when we get uh, to, uh, sorry, go ahead, Mark. Say when we go down to Nova Scotia and we hunt with our buddy Ryan, who is not here today, uh, this time of year, the ducks there are super fat, just like you're describing. There's like a good layer of fat and skin there on those. If they're and, uh, tasty fat, then those are some primo birds. But if it's all oh, sea ducks, then not so much. No, they're all blacks and mallards. Oh, there you go. Yeah. And like some of them spend time in the salt marshes, but there's no, there's no bad flavor on any of them. That's good. They're all primo. Some of the black ducks in, in around Delaware can be not so great. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, let's rewind to a little tidbit of information that you dropped on us and that's this super bowl duck wing recipe that you uh, were going to share oh yes so let's, this is let's thing, get into this this is a thing that i love buffalo wings and mm -hmm. as people from ontario by osmosis you should too yes um so buffalo wings are amazing but you can't really do buffalo wings the way they do buffalo wings with wild game however there's a there's a hack and the hack works for all wings. So the, 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 the emperor, the crown jewel of wild game wings done this way are turkey wings. They are, I mean, <laughs> the most amazing thing on the planet. Like, I mean, yes, you only get four pieces per bird. So you have to kill a fair number of turkeys, but we can kill five a year. So 
Um, so it works with turkeys, like it works with pheasants, it works with grouse, it works with waterfowl. So on very big birds, you'll, you'll keep the flat, which is the second, that, that two bone piece that everybody mm -hmm. doesn't eat. Everybody likes to eat the drumette first. So there's the drumette and the flat. So you collect them and I only keep the drum, I keep drumettes from pretty much every duck and the flats only on like mallards and pintails, you know, big ducks. So, and you, and it, this only works if you pluck your birds. And this is why that wax technique comes in because hand plucking wings uh, on a duck is doable, but kind of a pain in the ass. Uh, it's much easier with the wax. So you, you make this collection of them. And then the trick is to make duck stock only with the wings. So basically you make as if you're going to make a broth and you cook the wings, you a, you got an amazing broth that you can do whatever you want with. You can, you know, make a soup or make, rice or whatever and then you pull off all the wings when they're tender now they can't fall off the bone but they should be thinking about falling off the bone that's your hack because then once they're all tender already you toss them in whatever sauce makes you happy whether it's the buffalo sauce or honey mustard or sriracha or whatever whatever and then what i will do is i'll let them sit there in the refrigerator overnight with that that sauce and then to cook them, you don't fry them like you do with a chicken wing. You put them in a, like a 450 degree oven on a, on a rack over a baking sheet so it can drip on stuff. And, it, and they are perfect. And so with those wings, you can just go and pull the meat right off. And if you have a smoker, it's even cooler because you can either put them in the hot, hot, hot oven and get them crispy like that, or you can smoke them and then they, they're even better. So it's, it's one of these things that I'll, I'll, I'll pull it out for a party or, uh, or for Super Bowl, and especially for the haters, you know, like, oh, you can't eat, there's, all, there's no meat on a duck except for the breast. Well, all right, pal, try this. And it's, it blows them away. Wow. And it's super versatile because it works with any wing, works with any sauce. And the only thing you have to watch out for is because these are wild animals and because especially with waterfowl, Upland birds, it's, it's easy because they're pretty much all going to be ready at the same time because upland birds live fast and die hard. Waterfowl are not like that. Waterfowl can live to 30 years. So you could have a young of the year or you could have a 27-year-old mallard right next to each other. So they're not going to cook evenly. So most of your wings are going to be ready at the same time, but there's always going to be like, oh, there's the geriatric mallard in the bunch. There's going to be the, the odd one in the group. Totally. And you can either have that as like the, the Jesus and the king cake kind of deal or, uh, or just keep cooking it. Have you, uh, have you ever tried that with goosenecks? I've, I've had wings or like buffalo, like hot wings made with goosenecks where they, oh. they braise them down and then sauce them and then finish them off in a bake oven. And they oh, were really done. good. Not a, t not a lot of meat, but the meat was really good. Yeah, that I bet it would it. be. Now I've yeah, made sausages delicious. with a gooseneck. So you push the bone out of the out of the neck and you use the skin as the casing, and then you make a a, a duck sausage and you stuff it in the goose's neck and then smoke it. Ooh. That's super that, good. That is quite interesting. It's even better with swans. I just want to say, Damien, the next time we do an episode with a chef like this, mm -hmm. we can't do it at six o'clock at night because that's no, what I normally eat. I'm yeah, fucking starving right now. I know. I am too. <laughs> I haven't eaten yet. Like, holy Christ. I am too. So, we, so my uh, trick, Hank, is, is that um, I'm not a big lover of Canada goose. Now, that has a lot to do with the fact that I don't uh, put a whole lot of effort into cooking it. But I love, love, love mallard and wood duck and teal. Love it. Um, but my family don't. Um, and I think it's mostly because it's a duck and it's the idea of eating a duck and, and that's what they're, so my wife and two kids. So I'm really, so I'm getting off, when I finish this, I'm, I'm going on Amazon and I'm ordering Duck, Duck, Goose. Um, I'm going to get that book because I really, um, I want it, I want this to be something that my, that my kids and, and wife enjoys. And you never listened to last week's episode, but Steve was on and how he, his goal in 
introducing his kids to different cuisine and different cultures, which is a huge part of why he cooks. And now it, it I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm taking it hook, line, and sinker, for lack of a better term. And I really want to try and push that on my family. Well, push it and introduce them. And no, I mean, I think that's that's exactly it. I mean, uh, ducks for me have always been a luxury item. Like I like I said at the beginning of this podcast. And but for most people, you, you, they people love hunting them, but they're they choke them down. Mm -hmm. And and the reason is this. I mean, we can talk about recipes all we want, but at their core, waterfowl are not birds in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. They're beef. You have to think of the breast as steak or London broil in the case of a, uh, of a Canada goose. And you think about the wings and the legs as brisket. So the wings and the legs, slow and low. And then the breast meat is hot and fast. If you, if you forget everything else from this podcast, remember that. Okay. And the right. side piece to that is everybody I know who is getting used to cooking waterfowl cooks the tender parts too much and the tough parts too little. So they're like, I can't eat this Canada goose leg because it's too tough. Well, you didn't cook it enough. Well, it's too tough. Keep cooking it. It's going to fall off the bone. Just all I ask is patience. And he, the problem with the, the breast meat is like, oh, it's, it's gray and leathery. Well, you cooked it too much. And oh, well, I don't want it rare. Okay, cook it rare just to see what it's like. Yeah. That if you don't like it, guess what? You can cook something more. You can't uncook something. And, and people forget about that. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if Very you're true. just experimenting, undercook it. You can always fix it. You can't fix overcooked. Very good point. I think goes along too, as I've found with a goose, especially is the, the meat prep that you've done after you've got the bird. So, you know, up here, everybody pretty well just breasts the birds out typically. So it's, no skin on, no plucking, just just pull the breast. But there's a massive difference in the meat, especially when I've been out hunting with other guys where, you know, we all get meat at the end of the day and everybody takes them home. Where you've taken some frozen where you can tell that they cut them out, gave them a quick wash off and into a bag and into the freezer, as opposed to most of my stuff. When I bring it home after a hunt, I soak it in salt water overnight to leach out some of that blood just because the goose is such a red meat. It's so, that blood is so strong and has such a, a high iron fishy taste to it. Uh, to me, it has a, a fishy smell for whatever reason, even though they're not feeding on any fish, but uh, you draw that blood out, that makes a big difference in that kind of quote unquote gaminess. You touched on birds. a good point. So I am a big hater of doing that to waterfowl except in the situation that you just described. So somebody who saltwater soaks a mallet or a pintail or another quality duck, that's crazy. You're, you're removing flavor that is good flavor. But if you're perceiving a fishy note to your Canada goose, absolutely brine it. That's a, and, and the other caveat to that is um, if you've got a, a piece of meat, like a breast that's got like three or four shot holes and some hematoma in it, that brine will actually pull some of that blood out and it will make it more pleasant to eat um, because, you know, it's, if it's shot up. So one other little trick to, I can tell you about shot up duck breasts or goose breasts, take the side of your knife and just scrape it away. That helps a lot. People forget that the, a lot of people don't know that you can do that. You can, like, you're not using the blade of it. You're using the side of the knife to just scrape away all of that blood clotty hematoma. And that goes a long, long way towards fixing uh, a shot-up breast. Yeah, I have no problem cleaning up my my meat and getting all the blood out of it. Like, I'll if, I, if we have a good hunt and we got ten ten birds in early season, I take come back and six or seven of those breasts are well shot up. Like you said, that's exactly what I do. Is I take you can also use the shot-up ones as like if for grind. You know, I mean, awesome. if, you're, if you're killing all kinds of Canada geese, well, shit, man, you need grind somewhere. That's a good use for it. We got no shortage of Canada's up here. Yeah. Well, in, in our part, yeah, Canada's is, um, they're, they're everywhere. Um, not like 
Saskatchewan and Alberta, obviously, oh, but uh, next but, level. But ducks is like we don't hit those those large large number of ducks. We, we're we're sort of kind of in between two flyways here, and and um, we we just don't see those numbers. But but Canada's we see. So trying to figure out a way that. I personally, personally, Damien can can bring home my goose meat and be able to eat it other than pepperette or sausage, which is what I normally do with it. Um, goes a long way. Corned goose breast, corn like beef. Goose pastrami is amazing. Yep. Oh, I've had that. corned or pastrami are for Canada goose breast is that's another life changer. That's one of those things where. If you eat sandwiches, like if you go to work mm-hmm. and eat sandwiches, you can't kill enough Canada geese. Mm-hmm. Oh, awesome. I, I do not make, I don't make jerky or pepperettes anymore out of my goose meat because of any, any of the breasts that aren't shot up at all, all the, the really good, good breasts with no pellet holes, they all go to pastrami now. Really? And then I keep all the legs. I use the legs for most of my just straight up cooking meals other than the odd time, you know, I like to throw some on the barbecue or some throw a breast on rare on the barbecue, but, uh, and then the shot up ones tend to go for the ground and the sausage. I love the pastrami. A, a goose Reuben is mm-hmm. delicious. <laughs> now, now you're cooking with peanut oil, a Reuben. Now you're talking. So Especially great. actually. Just to plug Hank, um, Hank's, your fennel kraut recipe oh, yeah. is amazing with the goose pastrami. It's the only, it's the only sauerkraut. So I'm, I've got lots of German lineage. So sauerkraut is, was always a main staple feed around our house, but my wife doesn't like it. But that fennel kraut is the only sauerkraut variant that she'll eat. And she really likes it with the, with the goose pastrami. That's cool. That's good to hear. Cool. You always never, yeah. You know, like I put out these recipes, and sometimes they become quasi famous or well known. Like my venison barbacoa, everybody does that. Or my doves a la mancha, or the goose pastrami. But then you know, there's other things that fascinate me, like that fennel sauerkraut. And I never really hear if anybody's actually making them or not. So it's it's good to hear that someone's actually making it. No, actually, those are, I, I tend to, I gravitate more to your recipes that are, that, that are the, the foraging side of it. So actually, Phil, that, that Thai, that curry duck recipe, I've made yes. that before with pigeon. Oh, yeah. and, and it was really good with pigeon. Um, but yeah, I like the foraging stuff. My big one is to try and find somebody who's got some uh, English walnut trees and make that that walnut ketchup recipe that you have. Oh yeah. I actually, you know, the cool thing about the walnut ketchup is you make it like, eh, you know, once every three years. <laughs> and, and I mean, it, it doesn't go bad at all ever. And I mean, you can be seven years old and it's, it's still fine because it's so acidic. Yeah. That's, that's the number one on my list. I want to try that. It sounds too interesting not to put the work into trying to make it. Well, fellas, um, without, and, I, and I hate having to be the person to do this, but we, we are at around that 60-minute mark. Um, and as much as we are enjoying this, I, I do not want to uh, take up too much of Hank's time because I know you're on, you're on the West Coast and in a totally different time zone and um, lots of stuff to do. So... I did not want to take up too much of your time, and I know you're a busy, busy man. Um, this this was awesome, and and totally different than what my original plan was when when I had <laughs> talked about. Well, when I had talked about doing this this podcast and this show between Dave and I, and then Phil and Mark and and Ryan, and and what our goal was uh, when we created this show having somebody on so back-to-back episodes really because we had steve on last week but back-to-back episodes where we talk about food um totally different than what 
the original plan was, um, but awesome and awesome information and a ton that uh, that I'm going to take away. And and trust me, I am ordering that book tonight um, cool. because I I really really want to try this. Um, I I am a very picky eater, um, but I, I'm 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 certain that uh, if I put the the time into it now now I'm bitten by this for fuck's sake I'm going to become a foodie, aren't I? Well, that's, that's I mean, there's I a difference between are... being a foodie and, and, you know, being able to be not developmentally disabled in the kitchen. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well oh, put. Boy. Well put. <laughs> no, awesome. Hank, buddy, thank you so much for taking the time out. I know, and Dave, and Dave set this up, and, and Dave knows, and, and we all know just how extremely busy you are. And to be able to take an hour out of your day to sit down and, and chat with us and, and fuck, it, it was an amazing show, buddy. And, and I can't thank you enough. And, and I really don't have, I, I could go on thanking you and, and blowing smoke up your ass, but I'm sure. No you problem, prepared. man. I have a soft spot for Canadians because my grandparents on both sides are from Ontario. Oh, really? Where? Thunder Bay. Oh, Team Bay. Bay. Yeah. Oh, holy fuck. <laughs> the second largest Finnish population in the world. Next to <laughs> Finland. Well, I mean, well, maybe the or maybe the Iron Range in the Minnesota Minnesota part of Minnesota right there. So, yeah. But yeah, let's uh let's circle back when you guys start to kill some snow geese in the spring because I got all kinds of things to say about snow geese. Here we go. Now we're hey, you we know need, what we would need be to book a hunt. Cool? Yeah, is that if you happen to find yourself up in these neck of the woods to reach out to us and and hopefully be able to. Uh, you know, do something together. It would be, it would be awesome. And I promise we'll even black your face out. So the cameras don't see it. <laughs> no, you should, you should definitely have the, uh, just, just, just put the Guy Fox thing over my face at all times. Just okay. like a fuzz out. Yeah. That would be hilarious. <laughs> okay. That's what, that's what we're going to do. And if my editing skills were beyond novice, <laughs> Could you imagine? I, I would do oh, that. <laughs> yeah. I and would then we'll it. actually have to hunt on the 5th of November. Yeah, you know, well, it's gonna it, it's gonna be like Wilson from Home Improvement. <laughs> so with the fifth of November is a big day in my house. So uh, if you were here um, this past fifth of November, it would have been a good time. Um, with that, <laughs> Hank, thank you very much. I'm gonna uh, go around and let the boys talk. Give you the last word, and uh, Mark. Well, Hank, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, I gotta say, uh, I've had your food or I've had recipes that you, you've uh, put on the internet before I've ever known about you. Cause my wife, when I bring home food, just like any of the guys here, I bring home a lot of wild game and she's always looking for new and innovative ways to prepare it. And she has referred to your recipes before. When I mentioned you were coming on tonight or last week, she said, Oh, I know who that is. I'm like, really? And she's like, yeah, I've cooked some of his recipes. And I was like, pretty cool. So yeah, to put to, I can say I, to put a face to it, I could I can't say that because you're not there. But <laughs> but uh, it's good hearing your just voice. Just imagine anyway. Guy Fox. <laughs> yeah, just imagine. <laughs> remember, remember the fifth of November. Awesome, um, Philly. Uh, Hank, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on. Uh, I looking really looking forward to to scrolling through your website and uh, testing out some of these duck duck recipes. Buy his book. Well, I'm going to probably do that too. <laughs> and I can honestly say in the 34 episodes that we've had, Hank has got to be by far the most articulate person that has ever graced our Godforsaken podcast. <laughs> you just Ooh, super, super, super well spoken <laughs> yeah. and very articulate. And I can even spell that word. That's a big thing for us on here. It's like marmalade. Yeah. There were words that Hank used that I'm going to have to go look up in the dictionary, and that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, a pleasure, Hank, and thanks again. Anytime. Steve? Uh, Hank, it was, it was great talking to you. Um, I would have loved to put a face to it, like everybody else said, but uh, still, just to be on, it's like listening to one of your podcasts. Uh, so great to talk with another person that loves – doing stuff with their wild game loves eating and and getting in the kitchen as much as i do so yeah great thank you for coming on thanks for giving me this opportunity because i know the guys were really trying to surprise me 
they didn't want to tell me that you were coming on initially because they <laughs> oh, wanted really? to see me kind of, yeah, they wanted to see me kind of fangirl and geek out about, uh, big time about getting to talk to you. So yeah, I really appreciate it. I had a lot of fun. We yeah, really, too. we really wanted to see Steve horse like dancing and freaking <laughs> out. When you wanted that Jonah Hill meme, where it's like, <laughs> yeah, that's Big what time. you wanted. That's I, what we I were going that's for. That's what you wanted. Ah, <laughs> yeah. oh, that's awesome, Dave. Hank, just like everyone said, thanks for coming on. When we reached out to you, I was like, ah, probably wouldn't happen. And it's been a great episode. Uh, truly appreciate it. Uh, I'd like, also like to thank. This is our last episode for 2020, so I want to yes. thank everyone that's been on all of our 34 episodes and everyone that's supported us, everyone that's gone onto our website, looked at our gear, bought our gear, the companies that have supported us like first light, real geese, challenger ammunition, new canoe kicks, chokes, Canadian waterfowl supplies, hair and game calls. We appreciate everything you've done for us. And we look forward to doing more with you guys in 2021. Hopefully 2021 is better than this shithole of a year has been oh, from your lips to God's ears. Yeah. <laughs> so, this episode will post Monday, and as everyone in Ontario knows, we are in lockdown 2.0 here in Ontario for 28 days or whatever the fuck it is. Yay. Um, if anyone needs anything, needs to talk to someone, reach out to anyone that's part of the union, we are here for you all, and we look forward to 2021. We are just a PM away. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. Um, Hank. Well, just remember, Miss Rona's a dirty whore. Mm-hmm. May she die a horrible death. <laughs> I like it. Oh, so, I like it. I like it. I like it. There, there goes my articulate comment. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's awesome. No, oh. uh, again, Hank, thank you so much. And and you don't know, but I remember the conversation that Dave Dave had had, and he was like, I, I'm going to go for, for a Hail Mary. I'm going to a- ask. Hank shot to come on the show and it was a hail Mary on Dave's part and, and yourself as well as um, a couple other guests that we thought were hail Marys and no one would give us the time of day to come and sit and hang out with us. And you did. And we cannot thank you enough for, for taking the time to do so. Um, you know, 2020 has been, uh, has been a shit year. But you know what? We're all still here. We're all still listening. We're all still surrounded by the people that we love and that we care about. Yep. If during these holidays, just like Dave said, if you are not in that happy place, remember you're not alone and that there are people that love you and we would much rather receive a phone call from you as opposed to a phone call from the police or the hospital. So please reach out to us. It is a lonely time of year, but it can be a fabulous time of year. All you got to do is surround yourself with the beautiful people that you know that are in your life. And with that, I'm going to sign off. Big love. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year from all of us at Punisher Waterfowl, the Union 0430. And I dare say I can say on behalf of Hank Shaw as well. Big love, everybody.